Series 3 is kindly supported by Eagle Point Credit Management. Eagle Point Credit Management is a specialist investment manager principally focused on income-oriented credit investments in niche and inefficient markets. Founded by Thomas Majewski in partnership with Stone Point Capital in 2012, Eagle Point currently manages over $7.8 billion in AUM. Investment strategies pursued by the firm include collateralized loan obligations, CLOs, portfolio debt securities, and other opportunities across the credit universe. Currently, Eagle Point is the largest investor in CLO equity in the world and one of the largest non-bank lenders focused on providing financing solutions to credit funds. You can learn more about Eagle Point at eaglepointcredit.com. I also find there is a myth around the freedom and independence you have as an entrepreneur. And I think people want to shake off the corporate shackles and they want to go into the wild, wild west and be an entrepreneur and own their time and do whatever they want. But the truth is life doesn't look like that. It does require you to cater to customers and pay your team and make sure you have enough money to pay the bills. And there are other sorts of stresses, I think, as an entrepreneur, which I don't think they fully comprehend at the beginning. I'm Ethan Devitt, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast, a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment by focusing on its people and their stories. I'm joined today by Manisha Varadan, who works at Google focused on privacy and partnerships and is a partner at Zephyr Ventures, an acquisition vehicle set up to invest in profitable growth businesses. She is director of the Startup Bootcamp and is entrepreneur in residence at INSEAD, my own alma mater, where she also completed her MBA. Welcome, Manisha. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Ethan. Well, let's start with your background and career journey. Can you talk us through where you grew up, what you studied, and how you came to enter the world of finance ultimately? So I'm Indian, if you hadn't guessed by my name. I was born in Bombay, which is a fantastic city. It's where my parents come from, where we've had a home for ages. We moved to Bangalore, where I spent most of my life because my father wanted to bring us up in a quieter city. I studied media, fell into journalism while I was studying then went on to become a news presenter for the National News Network and ultimately got a scholarship to go to the UK to study media. When I finished, I had fallen in love with the country, which was, I studied in Sheffield, but I loved all of the UK. And I ended up getting a job with someone who just set up a financial journalism company writing about the stock market. And I accepted it. And that's how I fell into the world of finance quite accidentally. And I love to ask what people bring with them from those early career beginnings. What would you say your insights as a journalist and in media were that you bring to your work today? It's really, really, really silly. But I think of this quite often. I think it's my ability to process information and communicate with my audience at the same time which is a strange one. It's really something that you have to practice as a newsreader because you've got this year piece where people are talking to you from the newsroom, telling you all sorts of things that are going on. And you've got to read the teleprompter at the same time while possibly simultaneously talking to a guest in the studio. And that requires your senses to operate simultaneously, which is not something you have to do in everyday life. And so what this means today in my day-to-day job is that Yes, I multitask, which is you know not necessarily a good thing, but it is possible for me to engage with an audience, you know, while I'm talking about privacy on stage, while also trying to get feedback from the audience and think through my next thoughts and script and craft my story as I'm telling it. It's so interesting. Not something I would have thought, but actually completely true, because having done some TV interviews myself, the ability of those presenters to pivot and to process, you know, even breaking news. And weave it into questioning is quite something I probably underappreciated. So thanks for pointing that That out. That was one very technical learning, I think. But mostly from my experience of being a communicator and a journalist, I think it's empathy, right? And that works in any situation, whether you're working with product people, partnerships, privacy, no matter what the topic, you've got to interact with a human being. And I think that sense of empathy and being able to connect pays off while you're building relationships that will ultimately lead to, I don't know, business deals or more sales or whatever it is that is important. And let's move then from financial journalism into perhaps what took you to INSEAD and your current career with Zephyr. 
basically, I had accidentally fallen into my career as a financial journalist because I was helping someone run a startup, which grew tremendously over the seven year period that I was with them because they ended up buying a lot of companies, setting up fund management, setting up corporate finance. And I was pivotal to all of that because I was employee number two. And so I had quite a run and enjoyed myself. But then I woke up one morning thinking, I am not qualified to do this. Probably imposter syndrome is what you title it. But I felt the need because I hadn't studied business. I studied media, psychology, English literature. I hadn't actually got a business degree. And I said to myself, I must get the qualifications that match the job that I'm doing, perhaps. And so at the age of 30, I signed up to go to INSEAD and I was accepted, which was an amazing experience. When I was at INSEAD, I met my current husband. And the thought process while at INSEAD was, I like this path of entrepreneurship. I may not necessarily have a good idea myself, but I think it's a great idea to buy a business that's struggling and perhaps turn it around and run the company completely differently to what the founder is doing today. So that's how Joachim and I set up Zephyr Ventures. We spent a good two and a half years trying to buy businesses in Belgium and in the UK. And we had a fantastic time doing that. And then in 2013, I joined Google. So that was kind of how I landed into entrepreneurship. And then continued simultaneously alongside Google as well. And your interest in privacy, where did that come from in particular? Again, accidental. I noticed there's a question you have around surprising turns along the course of your career, and mine has quite a few of those. So I joined Google in a role that's called product partnerships. And our job essentially is to work very closely with the product and engineering teams to help them craft and launch the right product for the right regions. And I was looking after APAC at that point. My role was looking after Chrome partnerships for the region. And so I was re- I was the face of Chrome. I was representing Chrome. And before this privacy journey kicked off, I was looking at the web and how the web was so powerful for emerging markets. And it was at that point around 2019 when Google made the decision to deprecate third-party cookies, which is essentially what tracks a user on the internet. And the conversation started off being quite technical about what that meant for the web browser, what that meant for the developer, but very soon elevated or escalated into a conversation around privacy, which is what it is today. How do you, in the absence of third-party cookies, keep the web alive and still serve up relevant advertising? Because tracking a user on the internet is not a good idea. And I don't think anyone is a big fan of being served up creepy ads. So that was kind of how, through my Chrome partnerships role, I landed in privacy. But I'm enjoying it. I'm in Europe at the moment. The twists and turns continue. It's a fascinating place to be if you're working on privacy, because every day there's a new piece of news that's interesting and challenging sometimes. And so the journey continues. And let's move to that now and talk about the world of privacy today and the key trends. You mentioned tracking and cookies, and obviously that's something what we're still dealing with every time we open up a website. What are the key trends that you think we'll be talking about in the next five years in the world of privacy? From what I've seen so far, I think privacy has been a topic that has occupied the minds of regulators and to some degree businesses because in the interest of user privacy and in the interest of putting the user first, the regulator has jumped two steps ahead and I think the businesses are catching up. But what we will see, I think, going forward is finally the confluence of user, business and regulator aligning on the topic. And I think privacy will become a dinner table conversation if it hasn't already, because I think as a user, you will have to make choices about what privacy means for you and how that affects your online experience today. That's my sense of what's going to happen in the future. I don't think it's going to be possible to just delegate these responsibilities to your browser, to your operating system, to your mobile phone. I think there's going to be a time very soon where you're going to start making conscious choices about what you want to see and don't want to see. It's very interesting. I've seen an economic analysis be applied to privacy and things like the endowment effect, for example. How do you yep. think people put a price, say, on their privacy and or, or do they value it at all? I think it's a privacy conundrum that you know we're all trying to get our heads around where you have the user who's philosophically very concerned about the data that is acquired or used by large tech companies, but at the same time doesn't want to trade the utility of giving up that sort of data. And so an example is 
maps and how helpful it is to know exactly where you are and, you know, show the restaurants around you or, you know, have the assistant at home tell you what your schedule is and how you should be preparing for the day or whatever it is. But at the same time, all of that requires data. And I think there's a bit of a dissonance between I want to protect my data versus I still expect everything to be helpful. So a lot more work to come, it seems, on a, perhaps pricing that whether it's commodity or one's own unique privacy. And that's, sure. where, that's where I think the user has got to step up and start owning it, right? You can't expect to keep all your data to yourself and yet have a wonderful browsing experience or a wonderful interaction with tech because the utility of that, I think, I mean, unless you're using privacy preserving technology, which thankfully has come into full play, you know, and it's a fairly new concept. So people are still getting their head around how to use it. I think it's hard to imagine anyone being able to do both. So yes, I think the user will have to step up. <laughs> I'd love to then move to another aspect of what you're focusing on today, the startup boot camp and being entrepreneur in residence. What does that look like on a day-to-day basis? Thanks for the question. Yes, I do have multiple lives. <laughs> I feel like I, I'm some sort of character who dives in and out of different stories, but I do work at Google and I spend a lot of time outside of Google working with INSEAD. And in that role, I mentor students as entrepreneur in residence. So I'm actually about 15 minutes away from campus, from the INSEAD campus in France. And I pop in ever so often to fix a half a day when I get to meet anyone who wants to sit down with me and actually talk about anything. It's called Entrepreneur in Residence, but lots of times I get students asking about career paths, choices, decisions around having kids, working with their partners, you know, all sorts of questions. So that's That's the entrepreneur in residence kind of schedule. So I try and make at least half a day a month available for students. And it's great fun because I've been away from INSEAD for 12 years now. So it's nice to see what sort of talent is coming out. The startup bootcamp is an experience that we set up in Singapore. And it's run about three or four times a year with the MBAs, with the executive MBAs as well, the older generations. And it's great fun because we meet for a weekend and it starts kind of on a Friday night. It's quite intense. goes on for 48 hours you get a simulated experience of what it's like to be an entrepreneur. So you get a taste and really a flavor for different facets of being an entrepreneur, whether that's building a team or, you know, finding your product market fit or building your revenue or pitching to an investor. And then by Sunday night, you finish off the two day course or the two day experience by actually pitching to real investors. And because INSEAD is known to be a school that produces unicorns, we get some very high quality judges coming to the end of it. So we, you know, we get the likes of Sequoia or, Lightspeed Ventures coming in to see early, early ideas from the students. So that's the startup boot camp. It does sound fascinating. It seems you'd have to include sleep deprivation as well as some other kind of stressors, perhaps to truly emulate this yeah. entrepreneur's it's experience. Funny you say that. So the, so the sleep deprivation part is definitely part of it. It's called a startup boot camp for a reason. We've got 24 drills and it really works like an army boot camp. But we also have a few sessions that's quite realistic about the life of an entrepreneur and what that actually involves. And it's a bit more philosophical and it gets the students to do a little more introspection. It's not about their product or company. It's more about choices they make. And yeah, we try and squeeze all of that in in 48 hours. (laughs) And what would you say are some of the common myths that you have to dispel? Because I would imagine it's still somewhat romanticized, even though we've had now decades and decades of hearing from entrepreneurs about perhaps failing at the beginning. Would you say that there are any kind of common issues that you have to force entrepreneurs to see reality on? Yep. I think we see some repetitive patterns across boot camps, even in the same year. I think the first one is that I can't do it, you know, so they kind of come to the boot camp feeling like they would never make great entrepreneurs and they come out of it on the other side, having a team and an idea and a half a chance at actually building something while they're at INSEAD. So that's one myth dispelled just by attending the workshop. The second one is that you need to have an idea, which is not entirely true because everyone comes to, most people come to the bootcamp on a Friday night with absolutely no idea what they might want to build as a company. And by the end of it, you know, they've got something there and there's a process. It's all about a process and following the process. So we take them through the process of ideation and it is possible to come up with an idea, even though you don't have one. You just need to spend some time on it. I also find there is a myth around the freedom and independence you have as an entrepreneur. And I think people want to shake off the corporate shackles and they want to go into the wild, wild west and be an entrepreneur and own their time and do whatever they want. But the truth is life doesn't look like that as an entrepreneur. You know, we introduce talks by successful entrepreneurs to kind of drive home the message. But 
it does require you to cater to customers and pay your team and make sure you have enough money to pay the bills. And there are other sorts of stresses, I think, as an entrepreneur, which I don't think they fully comprehend at the beginning. And we actually have a dedicated podcast series focused on females and entrepreneurs from underrepresented groups. Do you find that the experience of women and people from underrepresented groups is different when they come to your boot camp? Are they coming with a different set of experiences out of the gate? When they enter the boot camp, when you talk to women who are considering starting a company versus talking to a man who's considering starting a company, I think there's a huge difference. I sense it, perhaps because I'm a little more sensitive to the difference and I've been passionate about shining a spotlight on the fact that 3% of the entire venture capital industry money, at least in the US, has gone to women. And 3% is a painful stat to keep being reminded of, but, but I bring it up as often as I can. Yes, there are differences. I think the level of confidence, which I think is otherwise called a confidence gap, is clear Women are a little more diffident, if I were to make sweeping statements. If not diffident, they feel like they need a lot more to be able to enter that race of entrepreneurship. The journey becomes tougher as they get onto the fundraising paths. So you often find a lot of spunk, a lot of interest, a lot of enthusiasm at the very early stages. They will pull the idea together, get a presentation, you know, go even test the product and get some early results. But the minute it gets to fundraising, they know they need to play a different game because historically VCs have seen different sorts of people coming through the door and that makes it slightly harder. So yes, I would say, yes, there are definitely differences in the journey. And I think it's our job as much as possible to be able to level the playing field if and where we can. And given at this boot camp, you have some experts in the field. You mentioned some of the, the big names that come. Have you managed to unlock some of the mysteries as to why this underrepresentation persists? This 3% is still as low as it is? I think there are different reasons. I've highlighted it in one of the HBR articles that I've written. It is down to the fact that the industry was formed on the basis of an old boys club a long time ago. And so People who tend to look at investments and deals tend to pick what they're familiar with and what they've seen before. And that leads to a you know, vicious cycle. I think that we don't do enough to support women entrepreneurs at the early stages. We don't build enough of a pipeline. We don't have patience to make sure diversity is a priority. And all of this was going really well before COVID hits. And one of the first things that takes a hit along with COVID is this idea of diversity and focusing on diversity. So yes, there were loads of funds set up by women, for women, focusing on women, women meetups and women networking sessions. But I think as markets get challenging, as the recession hits, as jobs tighten, you know, it goes back to the same old focus of making sure that you just survive and that you get the revenue in. So it's a, it's a bit of a struggle. It's an ebb and a flow. I think it needs constant attention. I definitely agree with you there. And we will put a link to the HBR article in the show notes. It's a fantastic, it's one of my favorite podcasts, as well as post it to go for articles. So thank you for contributing to that. I'm just building on that diversity point, because I completely agree that unfortunately can be kind of a fair weather concern at times, diversity and inclusion, when we're in more straightened times, if there's a recession around the corner, it tends to be somewhere that gets less focus. Just broadening out from the entrepreneurial world into finance as a whole, an area that you've also would know well. How would you say you would assess the industry today in terms of its representation, its inclusion of diverse groups? I think finance tries to make an effort, but it is nowhere near tech. In terms of diversity, yeah. In terms of focus on diversity, yes. I mean, I know a lot of people working in these roles in different organizations, you know, trying to level the playing field, creating more opportunities. I think there are conversations that are happening, but it's not inherent in their DNA a bit like tech is. I think tech is a little more flexible about, you know, how you set up and where you set up and who you support just because of the nature of tech. I think finance is a very structured industry that requires certain processes and controls, which makes it harder to build in diversity and inclusion. But I would say if I had to score tech against finance, I think tech is way ahead. Very interesting. And at the business school level, given you have, you're there a little day to day and my time at business school was over 20 years ago. What would you say is the mix there now? Are we seeing a broad-based mix in terms of diversity, at least coming in to study for MBAs? 
I think it's improving, but it's not 50-50. And some of the classes, you still get more of a male representation than, than female. You do see some very interesting female talent. I'm trying my best to nurture that talent, you know, because I'm so close to campus. But I don't think it, we're at 50-50 just yet. Yeah, so unfortunately, a little bit, a lot more work to go. But thanks for, for doing what you are doing. Let's go back to some personal reflections now. So looking back at your career so far, would you say there were any highs and lows in some of the surprising turns we talked about? I think the story that I like to tell, and again, it's you know, it's the story that you believe in. It's the story that you choose to tell. I'm sure there are untold stories in my own career. But the one that I love telling is the fact that my career has taken twists and turns that have been fascinating and there's nothing predictable about it. And I've often just chased amazing experiences and I've not had an upward career trajectory. I did not make director at Google, but I have collected a bunch of amazing experiences and people along the way. And I continue to do so because that's my not star. If you have fun, if you are engaged, if you connect with the right people, I think that makes for a great career. So I would say I've gone from reading the news to structuring a fund to running a corporate finance house to trying to buy a business, you know, working with product and now deeply immersed in the world of privacy. So not really one common thread, but enough to keep me engaged and enjoying myself. In terms of lows, it's a really strange one. I never thought I would say this on a podcast, but I have three beautiful daughters. They're aged eight, seven, and two. But the process of maternity taking those breaks from my career and just being a mom. It hasn't been a low because I love my children, but from a career perspective, God, it whacked me in the face and felt like I was in the 18th century. That's not the first time I've heard that (laughs) that feedback. And would you say, I mean, having worked in Asia as well as in Europe, do you think it's a question of where we're located? For example, somebody else on this podcast earlier spoke about raising their children in emerging markets and having just simply more help because there was more childcare available there. It was a little bit Absolutely. more affordable. Absolutely. I was creme de la creme when it came to having babies. I worked at Google, which has some of the best benefits in the world. I got four and a half months off. Okay, it wasn't the one year that you may get in the UK, but four and a half months is pretty decent. And I had live-in help, but it was just impossible to navigate my emotions, my drive, my ambition, and the expectations at work. And a lot of it is down to me and how well I was prepared for this journey and how I make those choices at these points in time. But a lot of it is just normalizing the fact that someone driven and ambitious can take a back seat for a bit and raise some kids and come back. I think that's not yet a narrative that's widely told. I think we're getting there. I hope to think we're getting there. We featured some discussions of returnships on this podcast as well, as well as I hope normalizing the concept of sabbaticals and taking breaks, but it's only by amplifying voices like yours that we can make inroads. So thank you for sharing that. Speaking of, I suppose, seeing people go before us and pave a path that we can follow perhaps or take inspiration from, were there people in the course of your career or your life in general who were particularly inspiring for you? The course of my career, I would say I come from a very strong family of women. So my mother is one of seven sisters and she has two brothers and they've each had fascinating journeys when it comes to their life stories. We've had, you know, amongst them, you have a sailor, a gynecologist, someone who works for the World Bank, someone who runs CNN. So really strong profiles that I think influenced me to believe that I had to have an equally colorful career in a good way. And so I think that pushed me forward into my 20s, into my 30s. And I think it's only now that I'm realizing that it's okay not to be so accomplished. So that was definitely one. When I was in London working in the financial services, I think there were a couple of women who stood out who would show me the way forward, which was amazing and very helpful. And then at Google, I think, you know, maybe it's also a function of age, but I think I'm I'm leaning towards, I'm being inspired by people who are empathetic and able to connect more at a human level rather than show off their career laurels on a shelf, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And at that connection on a human level, I think is something that comes from experience. It's not something we can read in a a business school module or necessarily in a book, but that's why I think it's because it is hard to develop for some more than others, obviously harder, but it is, that's why it kind of gets our respect. 
you came to my attention, not only, I think I must have heard one of your HBR articles mentioned, but also was following you on LinkedIn. And you had a particularly poignant and vulnerable LinkedIn post where you talked about your alopecia or total hair loss you experienced during pregnancy and had just a breathtakingly honest post there. Can you talk a little bit about that and the reception that that received? That was quite a sudden decision. <laughs> so I've suffered from this for about 10 years, but I think it's the pregnancies that really accelerated the total alopecia. And every time I would get pregnant, hair would grow back. And every time I pop the baby out a few months later, my hair would fall. Like most women have hair loss at the you know postpartum month four or five, but all my hair would fall out and it would leave me wearing a wig. And I was very open about the fact that I was wearing a wig with my friends and my social circles and people at work as well, because I do believe talking about these things definitely helps and amplifies, you know, a certain message. But I think in April last year, what I decided was maybe it wasn't necessary to wear that wig, you know, because then I think it, it happened also because I was in Phuket, I was on holiday, it was a very hot tropical country and I was by the beach and it was just annoying. It was just, and I kept wearing it because I had to keep up this image of the fact that I had hair. And then my sister said, why are you doing this to yourself? Just get rid of it, you know, turn that into your story, own it and you can do it. And I did, <laughs> and I found that quite liberating, but I must admit the response on LinkedIn was tremendous, truly went viral. I had three or four interviews with large media outlets who wanted to run my story. And I think people were just shocked that I would just come out and pull my wig off and display the real me. And that has continued since. It's had a ripple effect. I'm still telling my story. I'm still having people inspired and still people come up to me and say, what an amazing story. Thank you for doing that. But I, you know, I do think there's something in just being truly honest about who you are and, and where you are in your life that First of all, it does a lot of good for you as a person because it, you know, it just takes that burden off of pretending to be someone else. But I also think it does a load of good for people around you to see that it's okay to do that. It's not the end of the world. You know, life goes on after the big reveal. So yes, I haven't regretted it at all. It was a beautiful post and very empowering for other people with a range of conditions or insecurities. So thank you so much for contributing to that and to helping so many more. I'd love to just now ask about other words of wisdom. I'm sure that was a very profound moment for you, but we spoke about some of the people in your family. Would you say that those characters in your life have bestowed upon you any creed or motto or left you with words of wisdom that you can share here? <laughs> I have funny ones that I'm kind of coming out of in my old age, but my grandmother would always say, never, ever, ever depend on anyone for anything. And then my mom would make it worse by saying, you come alone and you go alone. And so <laughs> you're the only person on this journey. Sure, very philosophical at a very high level, but I lived by it for the longest time. And again, I know you're asking for inspirational quotes that should probably inspire your listeners, but these were quotes that I carried with me for a very long time. And I think I'm slowly recognizing that it's okay to ask for help. I think my parenting has completely changed my life. So I discovered someone called Janet Lansbury on my parenting journey because my husband's Belgian, I'm Indian, and raising cross-cultural kids is always hard when it comes to laying a common understanding on discipline or how you raise your kids or what's important for us as a family. And Janet Lansbury is a parenting guru in San Francisco who's kind of raised us through the process, and we've turned out to be much, much better people. And I think the lesson from that has been very strong and one that I've carried into my work life, which is respect. Respect for the child, respect for the human. And I try and apply that in every situation that I can. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. You said before that it seems like sometimes you dive in and out of stories when you tell your life story, but each of these stories is worth diving into. And it's painted a wonderful mosaic here for us of somebody that I've wanted to interview for some time. So thank you so much, Manisha, for sharing your insights with us. Me. And thank you for the work you're doing with budding entrepreneurs and for just keeping it real on LinkedIn and keeping the infectious interest in the entrepreneurship, which I love to follow. So I appreciate you coming here and sharing your insights with us. Thanks so much. For anyone who's listening, feel free to get in touch if you want to chat through any of those topics. I'm Ethan Devitt. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors and their personal journeys, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest.